So I, I'm just really going to uh, say, I'm going to take uh, Kenan on her word that uh, today uh, we're going to uh, have a chance afterwards to really talk about what it is that we do, uh, uh, what each of us do here in this in the session outside of here. And I can use these 10 minutes really just to tell about a really interesting project that I worked on. Uh, first, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself, uh, very little. Um, why am I here in a room full of scientists? I'm a dramaturg for the last 13 years. Somebody who teaches the theories and the practices of, uh, somebody who teaches or, or practices a dramatic composition, playwriting to make it simple, um, and theatrical production, uh, putting on shows, okay? Theories and practices, they're, they're all kind. We go back 2,500 years. I'm part of a dying art that's been dying constantly and, and will continue to die, hopefully, for a long time. <laughs> um, I'm also an actor. Before, I, I'm amazed that I'm a dramaturg, uh, which is a, a sort of a bridges practice in academia. Why am I in academia? I'm an actor. An actor likes to make things happen. Uh, dramaturgs make theater happen. Uh, you guys talk about organization. I saw some people write things about structure. Uh, it, there are many processes in the arts that are very similar to processes that happen in science. Uh, science and art are two sides of the same coin is what I'm learning through uh, the, the project that I'm working on, which is uh, the Center for Scientific Communication. Uh, and one other great thing about being a dramaturg is uh, I'm able to go to my students. I ran the uh, graduate program in dramaturgy for the last three years at Stony Brook University, um, State University of New York at Stony Brook. And I take very simple things as an actor. As an actor, I want to know about human relationships. I want to know what my character is, what your character is, why we're in the same room together, why we're talking to each other. Very, very simple things. And as a professor, I try to make them sound really complicated, you know, which I'm able to do. But then, all of a sudden, I come across this great project. Uh, they came to the Department of Theater Arts from, of all places, the School of Journalism, uh, where uh, the, the university really poured an, uh, an awful lot of money into this, this new school in, in a time of tight budgets, which was quite phenomenal. And they had a little star power. They had Alan Alda, an old Hawkeye Pierce from MASH. Um, does everybody know Alan Alda? I think, I think everybody does. One of the most trusted voices in America. Uh, you hear Alan Alda, you can all hear Alan Alda's voice in your head. He's been a longtime hero of mine. And sitting next to him and having you whispering in the ear as we're watching PhDs improvise on the stage is a phenomenal experience. But I realized something. Uh, hearing Alda speak set me so at ease because I, he spoke directly to me. He is not just the figurehead that started the Center for uh, Communication. He is not just a celebrity who's loaned his name to something. He is something who's, somebody who's been involved in science for the last 50 years. He's truly a scientist. I'm sure, I'm sure he'll receive an honorary degree uh, sometime soon. You know he's a spokesman, what he really does for a living now, uh, besides uh, making movies and uh, being nominated for Academy Awards, is he is a spokesperson for Scientific American uh, and does a great job at that. So what happened was Alda had a conversation with our university president, our past university president, um, and didn't understand why when he was doing interviews with certain scientists and was able to use his trusting voice to speak directly to people off camera, that they were able to come up and talk about the most fascinating things that they do in such a clear way. And then when the interview began and the camera was turned on, the scientists would go into lecture mode and they would start talking in terms that were incomprehensible to this very smart man. And 
clearly to the people on the other side of the camera, which was a mainstream audience. Also on the other side of the camera, who else do we have there? Not only lay people, but we have funders, right? We have political organizations. We have uh, a university. It might be people, your students, people that you lecture when you're, when you're teaching. And uh, Aldo was able to recognize this disconnect. Now, in my own background uh, in teaching in the Department of Theater Arts, in a large science university, we have a tiny little, uh, beautiful little place, because part of the university mission is to support the arts as well, right? Tiny little part of the mission. But it's been a little safe haven for me um, and my, my colleagues there. But I realized when I had my undergraduate classes, which were much larger than my graduate classes, and I would teach a class like acting, that I didn't have any theater majors in it. I had maybe one theater major out of 20 kids. At first, I was uh, uh, really thinking, well, God, what is this? I, I want to be in a conservatory. I want to be at uh, Yale, or I want to be at NYU, and really teach people who are interested in this field. But then I, after teaching for about 10 years, I started having students come back to me saying, Steve, I want you to know I really learned something in your class. I was able to do things that I wasn't able to do before. People are coming back as doctors and as scientists. They were able to learn how to express themselves in a certain way, and I got a great pleasure out of that, um, about being able to do that. So this is where Alda's and my paths crossed. Okay, he, we bo both had the same problem. Or it wasn't really a problem, we both had this uh, same idea and way of working uh, that we wanted, to do, uh, we wanted to work on. I was very fortunate just to be picked from the Department of Theater Arts because I do teach improvisation. And we uh, started out at uh, the Southampton campus at Stony Brook. Today, and looking at some of the other great groups we did, we're very closely associated with uh, the Brookhaven National Lab and Cold Spring Harbor National Labs. Uh, other groups, a new group out there called Pop Tech, which is really great. We've got people, uh, most people here do, we're not saying you need help. People need help communicating. Actors need help communicating also. But, but you guys have, uh, I can't, I cannot live and work by not communicating with people. Scientists are allowed to, right? You guys are allowed to be in a lab by yourself, with your knowledge, or with your one or two colleagues, the only two people in the world who understand what the hell you're talking about, right? You're allowed to be in with those people. And you're not pushed often, this is not meant to be a blanket statement, you're not pushed to communicate outside of your own area, okay? So the disclaimer that I give in each one of our improv sessions that we do, is uh, don't be insulted by that. It's really not to mean uh, to belittle. Not everyone has to be a performer. But in a world where, as Tobias said, uh, we Twitter, what we're doing right now, you know, there is, it is my observation, it's all this observation, that the relationship between what you do, your science, and the world at large, we'll call it, is getting more important. Right? It's not like, um, it's, it's not just uh, a method, the methods of what you do, things that you do are not just reserved for the science community. The lay people don't really need to know everything that you do. But sometimes, okay, this is, this is one of my ideas. Um, when you see a movie, you see an actor perform, you're able to, Criticize that actor, right? Now, you didn't go to school and graduate school for acting. But you're able to offer your opinion. Your grandmother's able to offer her opinion on what it is that the actor does. Okay? Do you think for a second that when you're giving a lecture, when you're talking about your science, that the people in your audience is not judging you in the same exact way? If your grandmother was out there, she'd say, oh, honey, you had a stain on your shirt. You know, or, uh, uh, so, you know, they, they'd have that criticism. They'd have some sort of criticism of you. Um, we're simply trying to uh, find out what it is, how, how we, what we can do to help 
scientists communicate their, uh, their um, science more clearly. Thank you very much. Okay. Trying to let people figure out why their mouths get dry when they're speaking in front of a lot of people. Okay. Oh, great. So um, we brought this group of 10 students together at the Southampton campus. And uh, we, um, the, uh, Alda and Howard Schneider, uh, felt that the most important thing we need to do to continue this very large grant that they got uh, was to have an evaluation, use a sort of a scientific method to see what was happening. So we're currently in the process of trying to evaluate whether or not this is really effective. Because one thing I can tell you, it's a lot of fun teaching improvisational techniques to scientists to help them communicate better. Okay, it's not just about teaching improvisation. The Center for Communication also works with uh, other experts in writing, uh, in the idea of scientists distilling their message. And uh, the most important part is knowing your audience. How often do you speak about your knowledge without knowing exactly who it is that you're speaking to? What are the processes that happen when you get up in front of people? Is it always uh, you speaking and a lot of enemies out there? And you, uh, through improvisation and through some of the games that we play, games that were um, codified by a woman named Viola Spolin. Uh, she's the person who wrote the book on improvisation. Um, whose book, uh, The Art of Improvisation, was really uh, originally inspired by the work of a woman named Neva Boyd, who was an occupational kind of person. Her, her uh, improvisational exercises were not meant to train actors. They were really for, for uh, children and people in industry. Uh, well, we, we used these techniques and found that they were really effective, but that was a very subjective view. What we did is we did interviews. We, uh, because of uh, all this popularity, we were able to get a lot of equipment, a lot of cameras and things like that. We were able to have scientists talk about their science, give a little two-minute presentation. And then we went through a six-week program. And then we would have the same people uh, present their science um, afterwards. We were able to give our subjective uh, ideas of what happened. But we, then we also paired that with uh, data from uh, surveys from the scientists themselves, and we're trying to develop. So this is what I want to happen in the conversation as it goes on throughout the day. If you, if you guys have any interest in this area, or uh, if your minds are spinning at, uh, at all, we need to have an evaluative process that's more important. What would that be? So that's a question I would ask you guys. What would the evaluative process be? Is it okay for to do something with the scientific community to try to bridge the gap between the scientific community and the uh, world at large, um, is it OK to have a little bit of fun okay, and to use these unconventional methods? Uh, we'd like to know that, too. Um, do you think it's insulting? Uh, and and I, don't think, uh, I don't want our project here to be confused with uh, projects that uh, might go into industry although we're already getting calls about that, about making, doing things that are better for sales. You know, so it's really about who is your audience and how do you communicate with your audience. Um, and uh, the, the growth and, and the stories, I guess we'll talk about them afterwards also. There have been some pretty interesting stories. Uh, again, I, I'm really delighted. I really appreciate your allowing me uh, to do this here. And I uh, just want to know, I want you to know that I'm uh, surprised about the people that I've met in the scientific community since we've been doing this over the last year, year and a half. Uh, because we have some great performers out there. Uh, people who are just extremely interesting to watch and to listen to. You know, phenomenal. I guess in this area I would be uh, in the facilitator category. Uh, we can have a lot of fun. Maybe later on we'd be able to do some sort of exercise where I can actually show uh, things that we, we do. Um, and I'll look forward to talking to you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>